Hey, Greg. I made it. Thanks for rescuing me, Richard. Sorry hey, no that. problem. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Have others joined us too? Yes, we Thanks. have attendees on the right. So I think we are ready to go. All right, great. Apologize. Uh, I'm usually very punctual, folks. I just had a little bit of a Zoom misfire. So let me, I won't share. I don't know if you wanted to introduce me, Richard, or I'm happy yeah. to jump in. Okay. Yeah, great. absolutely. So thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We, we are, uh, or I'm excited uh, to have Greg Bell speaking with us today. He's the CEO of Corelight, but he's pretty much unlike any CEO I've ever met uh, in that he is regularly doing the sort of things that I would not associate with the CEO doing, like uh, troubleshooting different areas, uh, helping with various aspects of, of Zeek itself, and the fact that he has such a deep interest in the open source nature of the project and uh, helping the project forward. So he volunteered to talk about um, what his role is with the open source project, and also to explain what Corelight's role is. And to tell you the truth, I've been at Corelight almost two years, and um, I just by going through his slides, I learned quite a bit about the different things that we do and the things we don't do, and why that's the case. So uh, that's why he's here to speak today, and uh, I'm really pleased that he could join us. Thank you, Richard. And the fact that you learned in that way tells me this presentation is long overdue. So um, thanks, folks, for joining. Let me share my screen. Let's see. Here we go. How's that? Does that work? Yes, looks good. OK. One thing I'll say, um, I'm capable of talking a lot. Those Some of you probably know me who are watching. So please feel free to interrupt. Or you can put your questions in chat, and Richard will interrupt me. I've saved time for questions at the end. Um, we've received a question or two already through um, the mechanism Amber set up, but um, others may pop into your head and feel free to um, put them in chat. Richard will pose them. Um, and if, if I, actually, if I could just uh, request that people put them in the Q&A, that makes it easier for me to track what we've uh, answered and not answered. Um, so yeah, I mean, chat will work, but uh, we, all, we have that little Q&A function at the bottom too. That's even better. Um, and are, we, are people unmuted? so they can talk if I need to. Uh, let me see here. Yes, I can do that. I will. I think that's a good idea. Do that um, for all. Great. Okay, let me change the size of this window. All right, without further ado, let's get started. Um, so thanks for that kind introduction, uh, Richard. Uh, let me see, make sure I can advance here. Good, okay, so um, let me begin with a note on uh, terminology. So this is a great screenshot, one of my favorite of Vern, actually that I think Seth captured at the moment when he was announcing the name change of the project that is uh, at the heart of our company, formerly called Bro, as you all know, a, um, a, 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 a wise reference actually to George Orwell's big brother and a reminder encoded in the birth of the project of the ethical dilemma associated with network monitoring. Vern did that very deliberately, but over time, the project, that syllable came to have other really undesirable connotations. And so the, um, the leadership team changed the name, and this captures the moment when that happened at what was then called BroCon in DC, um, a, really, a really good event, actually. And um, I will, because I'll be talking about the history of the project, I will sometimes call it Bro if I'm referring to it historically, as it was then called, and I will try to call it Zeke when I'm talking about um, a moment after the name was changed. And I have to confess, because I've, as I'll explain in a second, I've been involved in the project for a really long time, or in some way, since about 2001. So my, my brain is still being rewired from Bro to Zeke. Um, but that's, that's my uh, principle for using one term or the other in this presentation. Um, so here's a quick agenda. Uh, and uh, first, for those of you who don't know me, I'd like to introduce myself and reintroduce for those who do. Um, and I want to do that not because um, you know, I think that's all that important, who I am and, and what I am just in principle. But um, one thing I've observed about um, effectively helping to found a company and get it started, I was a second employee, is that who the people are at the very beginning, their personalities, their convictions, their orientations, the, their drivers, has a lot to do with how the company culture will turn out to be um, one year, two year, five years later, even if we have 150 people. So I think it helps to know something about who I am, what I care about, um, and what culture created um, Corelight. And then I'll tell you a little bit about the company, try to demystify it a little bit, the, um, 
the what, the, the how, and also the why, like why does it exist? That's a very important um, question for any company to answer. And Corelight definitely has a why at its heart. And so I wanna talk about that. Um, I'd like to talk about our investments and commitments to open source Zeek. These really haven't changed since the last time I remember really speaking publicly about this was at a Brocon in Austin. Um, so what I'm gonna say now is very consistent with what I said then, except now there's a lot more evidence to show that um, what I'm saying is, is uh, factual. So we'll talk a bit about that. And then I wanna set aside um, time if you have questions uh, to answer those questions. Uh, so um, strangely, I got into networking. I've been in networking for a long time before, um, before joining Corelight, but I got into networking because I decided effectively not to become a college professor. I was in Berkeley in grad school, finishing a PhD. Um, it was in the English department, but really in cultural history, I was writing a dissertation on the history of the belief and conspiracy of all strange topics uh, after the French Revolution. Um, and I decided I wanted to stay in Berkeley. My kids were in school um, and I was really, really interested in getting into technical work. I had learned to code as a kid, uh, eight or nine years old, and I just always really liked computers and I felt uh, more and more drawn to doing technical work. And I wanted to have portability in my career. I wanted to stay in Berkeley or move where I wanted to go um, and not be beholden to whatever academic job that I might be offered. So. I made an unusual career transition. I was finishing my dissertation, writing the final chapters and learning about networking at the same time and effectively just talked my way into a job in networking, very entry level job at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. I still remember the interview question that my future boss asked me the hardest one, which was, um, is, uh, what is the more general category, multicast or broadcast? I'll let you think about that if you're a networking person. Um, but anyway, this was a very, in some sense, a working class job. I got a Bix tool, a punch down tool. I fix networks in uh, telco closets. I really love that work. Um, and right from the very beginning, I got to know people in what was then called the Bro Project. Um, here is the earliest email that Vern could find because he's an email pack rat. Vern, for, whom, for, for those of you that don't know, Vern Paxson is the chief scientist at Corelight, the co-founder of the company, the creator of Bro and one of the most highly cited computer scientists in the world, and also a great and patient mentor. And you can see this young network engineer just declaring that he was going to deploy IPv6 at LBNL, and he needed some changes to Bro so that it could support IPv6. And Vern patiently wrote back explaining this was a non-trivial project. <laughs> and he gave me a little lesson in computer science and abstraction of layering and in doing things the right way. Uh, he didn't want to just hack in a solution to Bro. He wanted to do it the right way. And it's characteristic of Vern, I think. He said, it's not a huge amount of work, but it's a little bit more than a minor tweak. I think it was a lot, a lot of work. It didn't happen immediately, but eventually it did happen. And one of the things I really like about Bro Zeek is that it was uh, agnostic to IPv4, IPv6 from very early on. All right. so. I started in network engineering. I worked my way up um, through a series of roles, technical and then leadership at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And in the end, I had what I like to call the best job in networking. So I was very, very fortunate to be named the director of the Energy Sciences Network, which is the mission network, global mission network for the Department of Energy, which is to say it interconnected the National Lab complex and it connected that complex with large scale scientific experiments globally and um, also interconnected the nuclear weapons complex. Uh, and all through that journey in, in my career at LVNL, um, BRO, as it was then called, was kind of part of the water I swam in. It was a fundamental thesis of the security posture at LVNL. It went from being really eccentric at a certain point to being um, kind of, oh, an interesting idea. <laughs> uh, I'm thinking through the lens of DOE um, uh, uh, leadership uh, in, in Washington to being seen as a really cutting edge uh, idea. And about the same time, it became apparent that there was an enormous commercial adoption of open source Bro, and probably a, an interesting commercial opportunity for a company to be organized. Um, but it took a lot to dislodge me from the best job in networking because I really loved it. Um, we were building at any one time the world's fastest network, and a bunch of people in the Bro community still work for ESNet, which I will claim, even though I'm on the board of, a net, of another network right now, public network, um, ESNet is just the most exciting cutting edge network in the world that I'm aware of. It's just a terrific place. Um, so at some point in my career, something happened and I did something I never expected I'd do, which is I got involved in a technology startup. And what, what happened is our own bro um, 
deployment at ESNet needed a little bit of help. It needed a bit of a reboot and a sanity check. And I became aware that some people I knew and one I didn't were spinning up a company at that time called Browala. Um, that, so that's on the right, that's Vern Paxson in the middle, Robin Summer on the left, Seth Hall. Um, Robin is, they're all co-founders of the company that would become Corelight um, and all have different and critical roles in the open source project. Um, and at the time, the idea of Browala, I think, when I encountered it, um, was that it was going to be a, um, a services business. And it was also explicitly a business model and a steward for the open source bro, now Zeke. And that's because a long series of very generous um, and somewhat amazing federal grants in support of the development of the project were just going to come to an end. It's, you know, the National Science Foundation and DOE just can't, according to their mission, fund external software projects forever. Um, it, it felt pretty close to forever. There were maybe 15 or 20 years of grants from NSF or DOE, but that was really gonna come to an end. And if the project was gonna survive, the people who contributed to it needed to get salaries. Um, and so this, um, the early company went through some growing pains. And I think when I encountered Brawla, Liam Randall was CEO, then Seth became CEO. I became a customer at that point. I might've been the first customer at ESNet. And then I became really interested in these people and in their mission to build um, a business model and to support the project. And because I had been involved in the project for so long as a, as a sort of a passive consumer of the technology and a person who depended on it, I became pretty interested in whether or not it had a future. So um, what I did, and this is kind of how start, companies get started, I think, when I first met this team, maybe there was $5,000 in the bank. Uh, and um, I volunteered for 10 or 11 months. I got permission from LBNL to do that. And in the end, um, Seth and I and the others closed some big deals, put money in the bank, hired some people. And in the end, I took a big leap and hired myself into the company. And so um, I was the second employee. And, um, you know, we had six months of cash in the bank. And that was a big dramatic leap for me. I had two kids in private college and I left a really nice job in a pension system to do that. And then over the next um, year or so, we changed the name of the company away. From, it wasn't Brawl anymore. We changed it to Corelight uh, for various reasons. We were looking for a name that was, um, Brawl was confusing to people. And it was even then a little obvious to me that the name Bro might change. So it wasn't all that wise to embed Bro into the name of the company. And so we found the name Corelight uh, the trademark was available, so that's extremely helpful, but it's evocative in some ways that are meaningful to me. The core is about the core of the Zeek project, the core committers, and it's about the core of the network too. And the light is the light of illumination, the light of data. Um, so, uh, and you'll see that in a lot of our branding. We, we're not militaristic, we're not marketing fear. Um, we're about data and the power of data. And so that should be evident in the website in all of our communication and in the name as well. So back to me just for a second, because I think this will help explain um, the culture of the company. Throughout my life, I have never worked very far physically from a university. I have really, with a few exceptions, worked in Hollywood for a while, but mostly have been motivated by mission, um, by organizations that have a vision for the world that's larger than themselves. And I love mission organizations because even on a bad day, um, it's great to get up and advance a mission that's larger than yourself. And so I've been really fortunate to work for mission driven organizations or to study in them, to teach for them. Um, I had a prior career in human rights before coming to graduate school, worked for Amnesty International and worked in refugee resettlement and gang prevention work as well. So I really felt and the founders, co-founders really agreed that when you're starting a company, you get to decide um, what it means. And so we put mission in the center of, of Browalib and Corelight from the very beginning. And the mission for us is pretty simple. It's not about fighting evil, finding criminals. It's really about stabilizing institutions that matter, institutions of civil society, financial institutions, elections, um, systems of governance, systems of communication and education, even entertainment. Um, and, and now I think if, if you, you know, even systems of justice, so we're all thinking and talking and motivated by concerns of justice at the current moment. And I will say that if you care about justice, you need to care about cybersecurity. And that is the kind of why that we try to imbue into everyone who joins the company and try to make really central to our work at Corelight. So let me tell you a little bit more about the company because I think some of this may be unfamiliar. And um, actually, if you just look at this image, I think this was from 
RSA at, last year. Um, but you can see a few things. You can just perceive a few things. You can infer a few things about the company. We're not above uh, a, a pun or two. So Zeke, the high ground, I can't remember who thought of that, but we, uh, a round of cheers went up when someone thought of it. Um, we really, um, we love good visual design. We love design that is about clarity, detail, data. Um, we have a kind of um, brand idea now um, around the concept of giving um, durable structural advantage that comes from a high ground. So uh, visibility is about um, having a commanding view. Uh, and that view is really data centric. And that's what the details in this image are trying to convey. So you get something of the culture and the vibe of the company, even just from this beautiful image um, that was created by our director of design camera. And our product category, so the product idea behind the company uh, is network, is NDR. And if you're not familiar with that acronym, it stands for Network Detection and Response. Um, it is uh, an idea that's been sort of um, in gestation for a couple of years, and it was officially in some sense blessed by Gartner about 10 days ago when they published their first NDR market guide. Um, and so that's an idea that's a bit bigger than Zeek. And in fact, as a company, we're bigger than Zeek, as I'll explain now. Um, but, but, and you know, it includes um, various components of functionality, sort of observation, shading into analysis to, analysis to detection and investigation. That's kind of what the category encompasses. In Gartner's view, it's, it's what the, one of three elements of what they call a SOC triad. So there's EDR for endpoint, NDR for network, and then there's sort of the SIM in the middle. And so that's our swim lane now as a company. Uh, we modestly aim to be um, the dominant company in that category. We're quite ambitious. But I will say, and this distinguishes us from other companies in the space, we're really inspired by years and years of open source contributions uh, to this, what I will call design pattern. Um, the concept of NDR didn't just uh, uh, come to be overnight. Uh, and I like calling it a design pattern. That is a concept from architectural history and criticism. The classic book is here on the left called A Pattern Language by Christopher Alexander. And he makes the observation that there's certain architectural ideas that didn't really have to be invented by anyone, like the door, the hearth, the porch. Um, no one can really claim credit. They just needed to exist. And that's the concept of a design pattern. It found its way into technical work through this book, Design Patterns, some of you may have read, and it's especially prevalent in object-oriented software. But lots of people in our community have described a kind of NDR-like design pattern um, for years and years, uh, have just noticed what was being deployed around them and, and, um, and described it and promoted it. So here's a great book by Richard um, that, take, that, that you know, was foundational there. And Doug Burks too, who's spoken on this series before, did exactly the same thing with Security Onion. So um, this design pattern continues to evolve. All these projects continue to evolve. We take inspiration from them. And I won't go into a lot of detail about our product strategy, but I wanted to give you the sense of what we're up to. So. Hey, uh, Greg, that was pretty sneaky. Uh, that version of the slides you sent over didn't have my book cover. So that was pretty <laughs> sneaky. I like to surprise you occasionally, Richard. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, I think I've said some of these. I, I wanted to kind of divide this slide into things you probably know or you know, you'll know by the end of this talk and things you could be wondering. If I were you, um, a person in the community, whether you're you know, a customer of ours or a community member or you work for another company that's commercializing Zeek, and by the way, uh, we're tracking at least 15 companies that are commercializing Zeek, um, you might have questions. So um, we're a rapidly growing startup. We've grown quite rapidly. Um, I was the second employee. We now have, I think, 154. Um, expanding beyond Zeek, we just made an announcement um, last week that uh, our latest product offering includes a really thoughtful integration of Suricata. We've joined the OISF. We are now contributing to the Suricata community as well. And, um, and that's, and we think that if we commercialize an open source project, we're responsible for contributing to it. And so we do both. Um, the company, as I said, was founded by key people in the Zeek community. One thing that isn't obvious, but I'll just state it because it's true right now, is that we employ all the committers to the Zeek project. Um, and that's just a fact. It, it, it is, um, in, in the end, it'd be better to have committers outside Corelight. And that's one of my motivations for talking to the community is to encourage everyone to get involved and to deepen their relationship. But it does put um, a special obligation on us to be clear about our commitments, what we will and won't do. Uh, and I wanted to just state it as a factual, you know, uh, it's, it's just factually true. 
And we are right now, because we employ all the committers, we are a bus the business model for Zeek, um, replacing the government grants, as I said before. So I wanted to talk through a few things you might be wonder wondering about. So what are our principles, rules of engagement? What is the culture? I'll go into that a little bit more. What are we doing to support and engage the community? And you know, what have we done recently? So what's the evidence of some of these claims? What have we actually produced? Um, so um, I, I, get, I basically gave a version of this slide. I think it was two um, slides before at a Brocon talk. And, and I think it was um, the one in Austin. And the principles here and the rules of engagement really haven't changed one iota. Um, so we can, can absolutely commit to contribute money, time, engineering cycles, sweat equity, whatever needs to get done for open source Zeek and now, now Suricata. I will say the ratio of Zeek to Suricata commitments, if we just express it in dollars, it's, it's massively dominated by Zeek. We've just started to um, contribute to the Suricata project. And I think the best proof of that, and I have a little screenshot on this a bit later, is to go to the release notes for recent versions of Zeek. They tell a kind of amazing story. You just have to Google Zeek release notes, it's on GitHub. But it's um, many hundreds, maybe thousands of lines. And the density of contributions and the density of bug fixes, security fixes, and feature enhancements in, in the um, versions of the software since 2.6 is really quite notable. And that's kind of represents a, sort of a convenient transition point between NSF funding and Core Light funding. So we're really, really trying to increase um, the, the, the rate of development in the project. Um, we want to push its boundaries. We want to return improvements. Obviously, we are, you see Amber doing this tirelessly in the community. We're trying to build and sustain the community and serve it with podcasts, blogs, videos, and whatever it needs. Um, and we want Zeek to always have the reputation of being on the cutting edge of network security. It's, it's, it has this interesting history. There's a whole other talk in this and Robin and Vern give it really nicely, but there's a, there's a beautiful talk that can explain the feedback loop between fundamental computer science research that's gone into Zeek and operational adoption. And, the, and that's very rare that that feedback loop is complete. Often academics, and I, you know, I decided not to become one, but often, um, research is just never really reduced to practice, and that's a problem. But in the Z community, um, cutting edge systems and security research has been reduced to practice, adopted, um, improved, the ideas have been improved and found their way back into the project. And we want to continue that feedback cycle, uh, absolutely, even if the NSF isn't funding that work. So we will not, things we will not do, we're not going to fork Zeek, we're not going to debilitate it. And, and I would say, if we were going to do that, we would have already done it, you would have seen evidence of it. So we've um, funded and um, upstream significant performance improvements, many bug fixes, many optimizations, um, many features that um, we might have opted to just commercialize, but didn't, we've been upstreaming them. And really good examples, even early in the company's history would be the SMB analyzer. I think that was an important part of either 2.5 or 2.6. And the open sourcing of that had a lot to do, I think, with adoption of Zeek and Enterprises. The new supervisor functionality, which is super, super cool. Um, Zeek agents, spicy, uh, lots more examples. Um, okay, I wanna talk a little bit just about the culture of Corelight um, and because uh, it's so um, important to our commitment to the project. So like, the, the software and Corelight were born in the same place. This is a view from the Campanile, I guess, of UC Berkeley looking towards the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, we were both created in Berkeley. Um, and I, I went up to the lab to take a photo of the very modest office Vern was working in when he created Zeek. So the, it's, it's, it shows you who's a grad student. He had a shared office. He wasn't an eminent computer scientist. He was there in the same shared office with Steve McCann, who was writing uh, libpcap at the same time, Sally Floyd and Van Jacobson, who were <laughs> creating TCP congestion control. So this was a little brain trust. Um, and they were all the people in that little room would go on to have tremendous careers in sort of future of internet um, protocols, um, commercial success in the case of Steve McCann, and um, great academic success in the case of Vern, and now commercial. So that's where it all began. And Berkeley for me, uh, and I try to bring this into the company too, is this beautiful fusion of these two great ideas. One is a drive to change the world. It's incredible ambition. Um, the classic question at Berkeley is, are you thinking big enough? Uh, so I think um, I, I definitely learned that lesson as a grad student and as someone who worked at LBNL for a long time, think globally, think about big, big problems, be ambitious. 
And then the instinct for creativity and wonder. Um, I know everyone associates birth, Berkeley with lefty, leftist politics, but that's not what I feel about it. it it's, it's mostly about the ability to be surprised, to, to wonder, to be curious, to be deeply, deeply curious. And so those are two, the sort of ambition and curiosity are two um, critical motivations that we take into the company. And the other thing, if you don't know about this about Zeke, but the, um, the mission of supporting very large scale science that's very data intensive that involved the acquisition of massive data sets and the movement of them around the world um, really had a lot to do both with the culture of Zeke and with its early deployment. Because in these environments, um, it was impossible to put endpoint uh, management software um, on every endpoint that would be speaking TCP. Um, it was impossible to put perimeter firewalls um, you know, on 10, 100, 400 gig links. Um, right as those links were being deployed in production for the first time, it was just, it was, those were unobtainium or just infeasibly expensive. Um, and these global collaborations were ever shifting. They involved people from hundreds of dozens of companies, maybe I mean, countries rather, maybe two or 3,000 people in the collaboration. And so um, the compensating control really was visibility. And that's why Zeke um, thrived and continued to be refined in that environment. It's important to know that um, although this is a very arcane world that I lived in and that the founders lived in, for many years, this world of very high performance computing, um, uh, data analysis and networking. Um, it has a very deep connection with the culture of our company and the history of the Zeke project. So now we're 150 people. These um, are very poignant pictures because they were taken at a time when we could all safely meet together, but it wasn't that long ago. I think some of these were taken at RSA. So we, are, um, we have a bunch of people in San Francisco. We moved the company from Berkeley to San Francisco in order to be able to recruit a little more effectively. We have a really important office in Columbus, Ohio, which is where our co-founder Seth lives. Um, a lot of um, infrastructure engineering and DevOps goes on there. And um, we have a new office in Santa Clara, and we're also distributed quite globally. We have folks in maybe a dozen states, and I think in seven or eight countries at this point. For certain classes of jobs, and this is even before COVID, we've relaxed geographical restrictions. And so um, we're quite a distributed team. We miss, we really like each other. We have a great culture. We miss being able to meet each other in person and talk. Um, we'll, get, we'll be able to do that again, um, but that's a glimpse into who we are. And you know, we enjoy our time together at Corelight, and I think that comes from being mission oriented. Um, we are fanatically obsessed with customer success. Our, our subscription renewal rate last year was 99%. Um, we try to be low ego. I think at LBNL, I met a lot of smart people, people with Nobel Prizes who were gentle and kind, like Vern, and good mentors. And so we try, um, we try to bring that into the culture of the company and. What I said before about applied curiosity is true of everything we do. So to give you a little bit of peek into the business model and how we're selling, um, because it's relevant to the ongoing success of the open source project, the business model is what is called open core. And some of you may know what that is. Some of you may not have heard of it, but it is um, the business model now of virtually every big um, open source company. Um, Red Hat is a notable succession, uh, exception. It started quite a bit earlier, but most companies now um, commercializing open source have um, a multi-layer sort of um, geometry. At the, at the center, there is an open source core. It might be licensed in one way or another, and then there are shells of proprietary technology. We have a really simple you know, BSD licensed core with a, um, a proprietary shell. Some companies have multiple shells with different licenses. We haven't felt the need to be that complex. It's pretty simple. Um, that core is, is Zeek uh, and then more over time. And a wholly symbiotic relationship with the open source project. And as I said, we have a duty to su support and serve it. And, but I don't wanna undersell the commercial interest we have in doing so. It's not all, we are mission oriented and this is the life's work of our founders, but there is a strong commercial interest to, serve, to support and serve as well. Um, because if there's a big deployed footprint of open source Zeek, um, it's, easier, it's easier, much easier for us to survive commercially. And, it's, uh, and the community gets larger and more exciting the more people contribute to it. So we have a subscription pricing model. That's the new way uh, all startups work. Uh, I don't think I know of any that are, that are uh, perpetual anymore. Um, right now, our customers are dominated by um, large, high-end organizations managing a lot of risks. So, 
We have a surprising amount of nation state business in the US or US allies. Um, financials, um, utilities, oil and gas, cloud scale, manufacturers. Generally, it's folks who have a large stock. They might have um, a data science team that focuses on security. Um, over time, that, that segment will expand and we're, I won't talk too much about our commercial um, goals, but we certainly um, are very happy with our customers right now. They're very um, we're honored to have them. And over time, that segment will grow. And our ambition really is not, is not the true of all startups. Some startups are very clearly um, just features, not whole products, and they're looking to be acquired. Our ambition is truly to be a durable and independent company. Um, we, we look at, for instance, um, Palo Alto as, um, as a example in that regard. Um, and so we're, you know, we'd be, we'd be delighted uh, to be independent generational company. Uh, I, wanted to, um, I, I wanted to call out some specific people on our team who are contributing to Zeke and Suricata. You may see them on Slack, you may see them on the mailing list, and sometimes because of their, maybe they're using their you know, GitHub accounts, it's not clear that they work for Corelight. So I wanna be very clear um, that we have a bunch of people, it's about now 10% of, um, of the FTE working in research and development, including products that are devoted substantially to open source work. And then a bunch of people actually in the company who are really interested in open source and are very happy to contribute. Um, they engage with our community on Slack, they create documents, um, they create scripts. Um, but the founders here on the top left, I think you probably have heard of these folks. Robin is a, a committer and he's the project leader and has been for a long time, kind of the chief architect of the project. Seth is a committer. He's he's done. He's made many many contributions, including the SMB analyzers, uh, and um, he's an active presence uh, in the communities. Um, Vern is now um, on. I don't know if I can. I think I can probably say this. He's on a kind of a leave of absence from UC Berkeley. So he was the creator of Zeek um, and he's actively engaged in leading our research team and hiring and setting the direction of our research team. He's our chief scientist and he's now actually working in the core again. <laughs> so um, he's working on script optimization at the moment. And um, so he's very engaged in working at the core of Zeek, work that will be upstream and available to everyone. So, um, We've got, you will see John Sewick on the mailing list all the time. He's our release manager. He's kind of the glue, I think, of him that holds everyone, everything together in the release process. And he's very judicious and wise and impressive person. Tim is a new um, member of the Corelight, newish member of the Corelight team, but he's ramped up really quickly on Zeke. He's a committer. He's responsible for a lot of the performance optimizations. I mentioned Johanna is probably well known to you. Um, he's a, she's a committer. Um, works on SSL especially and also on rapid response detections and an imminent researcher. Um, Benjamin is new to the company, has been working, I think, pretty much exclusively on the SPICY code base. Justin is well known to a bunch of you. I say here he's the breaker and fixer of everything. He's the creator of try.zeek and he's kind of miraculous. And the other folks in the upper right are people that you're going to see um, from time to time in the community. Often, um, a, a, I see a very healthy thing happening where people in the upper right of this slide will communicate with people on the left-hand side when they have questions about Zeek and they'll do that in a public forum. They won't do that on the Corelight Slack. They'll do that on the Zeek Slack. And I think that's awesome. And I like to see that because it shows that, we, that we're being as open as possible in our process of learning and, um, and in our contributions. And of course, Amber can't be here today because she has a family commitment and she's doing exactly the right thing. She's where she needs to be. But I just want to call out um, the extraordinary effort of Amber, who's our community director and um, is tireless and really committed to serving all of you. Um, so she has made a big difference, I think, um, been responsible for, the, um, for coordinating a lot of work with the leadership team on, on getting the, um, with the Zeke leadership team on getting the website and blog updated. Uh, and Richard is um, participating in more and more community events and he's working on community docs as well. So stay tuned on that. I would love for the number of names on this slide to double as our, or triple or more as our company succeeds. Nothing would please me more. So I said um, there was a lot of evidence of code base growth and health, and I'm not anymore a super technical person, but last night I just went through some of the release notes and picked out what I thought were pretty interesting developments just in the last year or so, year and a half, and it's really pretty remarkable. I would encourage you just to scroll down. I mean, even just the um, security and bug fixes 
was incredibly numerous and handled very um, rapidly and competently by John and others too, Johanna and others. But in terms of just major functionality, the supervisor framework, um, the addition of broker, improved JSON performance, um, improved parsing and multiple protocols, lots more events, vector slicing, lots of changes to the um, Zeek language itself and improvements to it, um, new NSF events, uh, just lots, lots and lots going on. And I, again, will stress the significant performance improvements and those will improve, those, I'm sure that will get better over time too. But Zeek is using less CPU, especially when network traffic is relatively low and that's good for all of us. Um, the new construct of an LTR release, a long-term release, um, is, is really great and it helps everyone uh, track the state of cutting edge Zeek development if they want or just a stable release if they need that. Um, we've also contributed recently to what I'm calling rapid response detections for Curveball, Call Stranger. There's more of those coming soon. We want to get them out fast when a network resident um, threat is really it can be detected just because there's Zeek events we just need to pluck out and search for. We want to get those detections out really soon to the community so everyone can take advantage of them. A community ID, also Christian's work. Um, okay, so um, on the community side, not so much the coding side, I would point to Spicy, uh, long anticipated by this community, what a cool new major functional component of Zeek. So this is a new framework um, and a language for writing parsers in a way that's going to be a lot faster and less error prone um, than BinPack. And Robin has been working on it and talking about it for a long time. Now it's out in the community and some of you are trying it, which is awesome. Zeek Agent, a bit of glue with OS Query, which is super exciting. And Sigma, the integration between Zeek and Sigma is great. Um, all these other, uh, at the bottom, um, I would say um, signs of rapidly growing community and engaged community are very encouraging to me. So the Slack is super cool. It launched just a couple months ago. We've now got uh, 435, it's probably 440 now members. Every, and, and there's a lot of great dialogue on that. And just last night, I noticed that Vern answered a question. Someone had a technical question. Vern said it was something about forward references, uh, case closed. And um, so you'll see the founders hang out on Slack. Uh, the mailing list is still active as well, but Slack is a forum that a lot of people prefer. Um, all right, so I would say, um, just as a little bit of a call to action, we are inspired by the community. We get energy from it. Um, this symbiotic relationship that I described is really good for both parties. And so I encourage you to deepen your engagement in the community, get excited about it and do what you can do. And there are many ways to contribute to make it a better community. I for sure join the Slack and the mailing list. Um, I would read the documents, provide um, feedback on them. Um, Richard's working on improving them a little bit, and, and, but you can do that. You can submit pull requests. You can try Zeek online using try.zeek.org. You can um, try to deploy it, just experiment with it. Um, You can, one thing I think that um, when I'm listening, I do a lot of listening to community calls, I hear um, a great hunger for more use cases, uh, more operation, more sharing of operational experiences. So I think if we can sort of get past the boundaries that we all have around us as security people, because there's a little bit, as security people, we're naturally a little bit suspicious, we don't love to share. Um, but I think if we can build communities of trust and share, um, the, the Zeek community will be stronger and the Zeek project will be uh, richer as a result. Um, there's a new package contest coming. Um, we underwrite that, Corlite underwrites that, but the goal is to just get people excited and to give them a sense of empowerment that they can write packages too. The, the last one may have been a little too narrow, um, but I think Amber has mentioned this. Um, she suggested and the leadership team has suggested that the new one be broader and there be roles for multiple kinds of contributions, like just having an idea for a package. So it'll be a little more um, welcoming, I think, and I encourage you to consider entering it and just committing a little time, um, just finding a way, finding something that needs doing. Um, Amber's always asking for volunteers and asking for help. So I would say um, take up her call um, she's very friendly, send her a note uh, and get involved. I think the big idea here for me is that the global community of defenders can build um, an open um, architecture for MDR, for network-based defense, not a black box architecture. I think that's powerful. Um, I think to me, it's very inspiring. It's very forward looking. It feels very modern, very data centric. Um, we can do that together. And um, we'd love to facilitate that at Corelight. 
All right, so um, I left some time for questions and I'm happy to take them. There, there was at least one that came in via Amber's survey, but Richard, I'll let you be the master of ceremonies for questions. All right, great. Well, if anyone who's on the line wants to put a question into the Q&A, please feel free to do that. Um, I'll have, I have one, Greg, that I wanted to bring up when you were speaking, but I decided to wait till the end. Um, you talked about, for, for some reason, and I'm going to see if we can come up with an answer to this. For some reason, things that are associated, or academic research that is associated with the Zeke project tends to get used operationally, where other research tends not to. And I was wondering if that had something to do with people adopting Zeek as their platform of choice for creating new capabilities. Now, so for, in contrast, imagine if every time someone had to introduce a new bit of computer science or security research, they had to invent an equivalent of C or Python or whatever, you know, they had to do that. Um, whereas people who are using Zeek can say, all right, I'm just going to add this specific functionality that that gets my point across in my research, I'm gonna add that as a script to Zeek or if they have to go a little bit farther, they do that. Do you think that might have, have something to do with it, that it provides you with this platform to build on without having to invent the wheel or reinvent the wheel? Yeah, for sure. I was gonna provide a different answer, but that's a really good one. And it has, it comes back to, I think, you know, Robin, Seth and Vern, like they created something that was extensible, meant to be a platform and um, meant to be extended. And so it it's actually has that sense of accessibility to it. You don't have to patch the core to try out a new idea. You, you might be able to just write in a, in a scripting language that you can certainly learn. Spicy is a further um, step forward in that, in that same direction. So it's just the modularity and extensibility of, of Zeek. Everywhere you look, some, if there's something you want to do, it's probably been thought of. You want to interact with network components, there's net control. Johanna contributed that. Yes, it speaks OpenFlow. It can speak CLI. You know, there's just so many neat elements to the toolkit. Um, and another thing I would say is it's really an expression, and this gets back to the point about a company acquiring the culture of the founders. The project acquires the culture of, of its creators. And so Vern and Robin and Seth are actually really, really interested and their work um, being used operationally. So um, and when you think about Vern's many, many contributions to computer science, they're all, um, it's, he's, he's not, he's, he didn't choose theoretical computer science as a discipline, and not that there's anything wrong with theoretical computer science, but his work is very applied, and he's passionately interested in um, operational utility, which is why his detections and, and the academic work he's done are famous for having most false positive rates. And Robin's systems work and systems research similarly is really focused on scale, correctness, um, performance. And so I think maybe it's a combination of the architecture and the commitment of these two uh, you know, great computer scientists and Seth as well, who, who started as an operator. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. We do have a question that was posed previously, and you may have addressed it in the slides, but I figured might as well just ask it anyway. Uh, who owns Zeek? Zeek is, um, right now it is owned by, I mean, I don't, I don't you know, it's a good question. Um, it, it is a project housed at the International Computer Science Institute. I'm not enough of a lawyer to say who owns it. It's BSD licensed which means it has the most anarchic license and anyone can fork it and do what they want. But its institutional home is the International Computer Science Institute in Berkeley, it's called ICSI. Um, and it's governed by a leadership team of, of really dedicated volunteers who come from the community. Some of them are Corelight employees, certainly not all of them, and, but all of them have longstanding commitments to um, promoting Zeek and its adoption. A lot of them come from the research and education um, institutions that were sort of the birthplace of Zeek. Um, and if Amber or one of the LT members uh, were here, they could probably provide a better answer, but Corelight definitely does not own Zeek. Okay, cool. Um, here's another question that was posed uh, through a survey. Uh, the Zeek project uses a lot of Corelight resources. Is information shared with Corelight sales or marketing? Um, that's a good question. And, you know, I'll try to answer as honestly and forthrightly as I can. The, the um, well, in terms of information, information that we collect, there's a really simple question maybe there, not the broad question I was imagining. The simple question might be if we collect information, say for a community capture the flag, and we happen to be using Corelight resources for that, Amber is very, very careful that we don't inappropriately share that information. And we always disclose if we'll use um, 
you know, if we'll share information um, when we collect it. But the general idea is that there's something of a firewall between the company and the community activity. When the company first got started, that was a little less feasible because we all just sat around a conference table in Berkeley to, to build products and to, to sell things and, and to just get the thing off the ground. Um, but over time, as we kind of develop internal organs as a company, people begin to have job descriptions that are wholly connected either with the enterprise side or with the open source side. And maybe just to give you a little visibility into the org structure of the company, Robin, who leads the open source side of the company, reports directly to me, not to products or engineering. Amber also reports directly to me. And so there is um, maybe not a perfect firewall between products uh, and, and engineering and open source, but very often, um, but, but there's no sort of consultation with the commercial side of the company on the roadmap of the open source project. And very often when Robin announces something or Vern or Seth about the future of the open source project, everyone in the company at Corelight who's not on the open source side learns at the same time. In fact, that's the norm now, learns at the same time as the rest of the world. That's actually a, an ideal that we, we would strive for. Excellent. Um, so there's a question here, which you've answered already, but I'm going to see if I can put a different spin on it. Um, the question was, what does Corelight contribute in terms of time, resources, and financial support? So you've talked about that, but could you talk a little bit about how some people in the company, like that's their job versus other people uh, like myself who contribute a certain amount of time? Yeah, I think it's that slide that showed about 15 people. And, and um, right now, what I like to think about myself is when, at what point did Corelight's financial contribution actually exceed that of the NSF or DOE in any mm. given year? And I think that was probably a couple of years ago. So I don't know if I should try to add up the salaries of all those people and overhead and travel and everything else, but it's a really significant commitment that certainly now in the, you know, definitely, you know, seven figure, um, uh, area. And um, we'd love to do more. I mean, right now, about 10% of R&D is dedicated to open source. Um, we, we basically put every dollar that we can afford to put either into open source or research, essentially um, adding to the value of the community or creating um, new intellectual property that could be of use to the community or to the company. So um, it's all those people I mentioned, and I probably left some people out too. And honestly, if I give this talk again in a year, I expect to be using two slides and not one. Mm. Could you talk a little bit about uh, our involvement with Suricata? Yep. Um, so um, Brian, who I think, who's our chief product officer, uh, gave a, wrote a great uh, blog post on the Corelight blog about sort of Suricata and Zeke being like chocolate and peanut butter. Um, they are highly complementary um, projects that were, um, you know, they're all born sort of the same time within five or six years, I think, Zeke, Snort, and Suricata. Um, they have very different ideas, um, and they are in some ways growing towards each other, right? So um, Suricata is famous for having highly opinionated, um, it's highly opinionated data. This is good, this is bad. Um, that's less true now, but there's a little bit of metadata and, and more and more of that over time. Um, Zeke can have opinions too. So th th they're great tools, both of them, and they're fit for different purposes. And we see them not as competitors, but as highly complementary. We love the idea of joining forces with the OISF and, and supporting um, Suricata development. One of our developers is actually a Suricata contributor, and we have carved out time in his workday to contribute just to Suricata. Um, and we think we've integrated them in our product in a really lovely way so that um, the, you know, Suricata alerts kind of flow through Zeke's communication system. Um, they take advantage of um, the ability to run on the same cores. Um, and the, the, what you need of each is readily available if you're an incident responder. So I just see them as both just great projects. Um, both are worthy of our support and they're better together. Cool. All right. Any other questions from the crowd? Oh, one just came in. Uh, yeah, what is the advan what I guess what are the advantages of the Zeke Corelight structure compared to the normal open source foundation organization? Um, the, so the Zeke Corelight is not at all incompatible with having a foundation. Um, so the leadership team, and I'm not on the leadership team of the Zeke project, could decide to, um, to, to start a Zeke foundation. 
Um, some projects do that, or some just join the Linux Foundation. Um, it, right now, the International Computer Science Institute is a 501c3, so that's good, but it's not a dedicated foundation just for Zeek. Um, I think typically, um, like projects do that if they are um, a bit larger. Um, it's, it can be a bit expensive to create a foundation. There's legal costs, and if you join an existing foundation, there are overhead costs as well. Often foundations are used, in my um, understanding, and I'm not an expert in this space, to mediate um, multiple corporate interests so they can become a very useful um, structure if you have um, maybe a pay to play um, governance um, um, structure or the need to mediate multiple potentially competing corporate interests. Um, right now, this is a little bit less formal um, and it seems to be fitting with the state of maturity uh, um, of the project, but anything's possible in the future. Okay. Um, I'll ask a question. Do you have any advice as a CEO for people who are trying to navigate this year? I think, I mean, with this clearly lots of challenges happening right now. So uh, what sorts of advice have you been giving the people at Corelight? I, I obviously have been listening to you, but for those of you, those of people on the, on the call who don't work at Corelight. Yeah, I think that's a, um, wow, what a season of pain for all, for everyone, right? Globally and, and one pain succeeded by another. So I think um, for us, I feel that the combination of COVID and also the rising conscious, consciousness of racial injustice that we're talking about in the company has drawn us closer together. And, and I guess my recommendation would be maximize empathy, over communicate, um, find ways to build um, social bonds, uh, even through this imperfect portal of Zoom. Um, really, really get to the heart, talk, talk about anxiety, talk about fear, talk about pain, get to the heart of all that because everyone's thinking it. And um, don't let that get bottled up, make it front and center of a, of a company conversation. Um, I know everyone's navigating this in whatever environment they're working in, so I don't think I have any unique advice, but we're, we're trying to kind of lead with our heart and lead with empathy. Um, and, and by the way, our business, because it's relevant to, um, you know, to the future of the project is doing pretty well. And um, I know that's not true of every business, but we're, we're pretty optimistic. Um, it's certainly been affected by COVID, but um, we are very optimistic about our ability to sustain um, and this idea of being a business model for the Zeke project going forward. So along those lines, um, many, many CEOs that I've known over the years have come up through the sales organization or the marketing organization. Sometimes they've been the chief financial officer, uh, but I would say my favorite CEOs like Kevin Mandia and yourself, they've come up through the operator side of the world. So I was wondering, because I'm guessing the types of people we have on these calls are more on the operator side. Could you give any advice to someone who might be interested in a leadership role and potentially even becoming a, you know, a C-type person or a CEO? Sure, such as it is, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of, of my own thoughts about it. The big transition in this, in this um, journey is the first. It's the transition from being an individual contributor to being a group lead. There, um, everything changes and you're suddenly very disoriented. So the, the immersion into management is tough and it can be tough for a few years. Um, it's important to remember you don't change as a person, you don't necessarily lose technical acumen, but the ratio of your commitments every day changes. And over time, your work product changes. Your work product is really um, consensus, decisions, leadership. Um, and then that transition from management to leadership happens a bit later. Um, what I'll tell you about my unexpected joy in getting involved in Corelight is that I have found that I love starting, like tackling projects that are almost impossible, but not quite, not quite. Um, and I love the constant novelty that life in a startup brings. In the DOE environment, maybe in, the, in many others, there's a kind of repetition of the budget cycle approval cycle and all that, but in a startup, and I didn't quite expect this, the need to be on your toes and created and in the moment and really um, present is critical. And I've just loved it. So I would say, if you want to talk to me, send me a note at Greg at Corelight if you're thinking about any of these topics, because I've lived through them painfully. And, and maybe if I had talked to someone earlier in my career, I would have, um, I would have adapted a little more flexibly to all those changes. That's, that's great. I, I, on a, 
on another uh, sort of running a company note, I don't know if people realize, you know, we're a Silicon Valley company, Berkeley company, but we're also, uh, we have a lot of people in Columbus, Ohio. And I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about what's it like or the idea behind uh, recruiting talent outside of the same pockets that everyone goes to all the time. I think what had seemed to be an eccentric decision that was honestly not strategic and often in a company, things will happen that are not strategic. They're a bit accidental. So Seth was in Columbus and for us as a, when we started, we didn't have venture funding, we were bootstrapping. And so we we're really cash sensitive. And so the cost of real estate and salaries and everything else was more attractive in Columbus. Um, now with COVID, I think what had been an eccentric choice is now going to be conventional wisdom that we need to find a way to include people um, from all over the country, even in Silicon Valley and the world in Silicon Valley companies. And I actually think that will be very good for this world. It'll be good for the communities um, that these people, smaller communities that our employees work in. It'll be good for San Francisco as well. It'll help alleviate some of the social stresses in San Francisco. So I'm optimistic about this idea. And I think Columbus is awesome. It's a bit overlooked as a second city, but not so much. It's now got at least one, maybe $2 billion companies there. It's getting a little competitive, but it's got a great university great people, loyal, smart, terrific people. And um, I look forward to visiting there. We're not, we're not allowed to again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed my visit there, definitely. Um, I guess uh, maybe the, so the final question would be around open source. I think that the fact that open source is almost inherently global, do you think that's a factor in helping to meet some of the challenges we have of, of trying to find people who would work on, on the project? Yep, um, we, for sure. And in fact, um, I would say our open source and our research teams where the skills are maybe the, the least um, broadly distributed um, are the most globalized teams. And they really led the way. And Robin, for those who don't know, has moved to Munich. So um, we have a pocket of um, Corelight employees, both open source and commercial in Germany now. And honestly, a lot of what I feared about friction or difficulty and collaboration didn't come to pass. And we're all getting better at that. So it's, it might well be true that open source companies are more open to that because the collaboration starts at the heart of the company. That core that I talked about starts by being global. And so the rest of the company can emulate that. Great. Well, Greg, thank you so much. We are at the end of our time, but thank you for your insights and for sharing uh, your thoughts on, on Corelight and how we work with Zeek. And uh, thank you for the invitation to, if anyone wants to follow up with Greg the, uh, around the leadership questions. Uh, we look forward to the next webinar. I, I believe uh, I'm hosting one tomorrow at 3.30, 3.30 uh, Eastern. So uh, we look forward to seeing you all there. And of course, we'll have another one of, of these wonderful presentations coming up as well. So just keep your eyes on the mailing list and on the Slack channel. So thank you everyone. Thank you, Greg. Thanks folks, take care.